1982, 15-year-old Karen Stitt was a recent transplant to the West Coast. She had recently moved to Palo Alto, California from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to live with her father and brother. She was a student at Palo Alto High School. One of her classmates there described her as a cool chick who always wore rock t-shirts and a big smile, although she generally remained rather shy in class. Karen developed a social life and learned how to navigate public transportation in California very quickly. She began dating a boy from the nearby town of Sunnyvale and would regularly travel by bus to see him. Karen rode the bus to Sunnyvale on the evening of September 2nd, 1982 to spend time with her boyfriend, David. Karen met David at a bus stop near the intersection of El Camino Real and Wolf Road in Sunnyvale sometime between 8 and 9 p.m. The couple then went into a 7-Eleven convenience store by the bus stop to buy something to drink before heading on to Golfland, a nearby miniature golf course. They later walked to the grounds of a local elementary school. Around midnight, David and Karen began walking back to the intersection where they had met up earlier in the evening so that Karen could catch the bus back home. David opted not to walk her all the way back to the bus stop, however, as he was worried he would get in trouble with his parents for getting home later than they had instructed. He felt guilty for not walking Karen all the way back to the bus stop and waiting with her. He last saw Karen as she was just south of the intersection where the bus stop was located, just before she reached it. Just before 11 o'clock the following morning, a truck driver was making a delivery to the garden center near the bus stop where Karen would have needed to catch the bus. Amongst the bushes at the base of a retaining wall that ran along the garden center's driveway, he noticed a nude young woman. He notified the staff at the garden center, who in turn called the police, who confirmed that the young woman was deceased. She was later identified as Karen Stitt. Karen's hands had been bound behind her back with her own shirt, and her jacket was found tied around her left ankle. Karen had been stabbed a total of 59 times in her throat, back, abdomen, and chest. 18 of the wounds had pierced her heart, and 10 of them had perforated her lungs. Karen had also been raped. Leaves and dirt around her feet had been disturbed, and markings in the dirt indicated that the ground may have been kicked meaning that Karen may have still been alive when she was left at the location. Karen's killer had left numerous pieces of evidence at the scene, although it would be nearly 20 years before it could be properly analyzed. In 2000, evidence from Karen's case was sent to the Santa Clara County Crime Laboratory. Technicians there were able to develop a male DNA profile from both a blood stain left on the top of the cinder block retaining wall just above Karen's body when it was discovered, and from a cutting that had been taken from Karen's jacket, which had been tied to her ankle. The DNA profile from each of the samples was from the same individual. The crime lab was also able to identify a partial male YSTR DNA profile from sperm cells found on slides from vaginal swabs taken during Karen's autopsy. While this was not a complete profile, it was consistent with the DNA profile found on Karen's jacket and in the blood on the retaining wall. Unfortunately, there was no match to the DNA profile in any criminal database. David, Karen's boyfriend at the time of her death, provided a DNA sample, which was not a match to the DNA found at the crime scene, excluding him as a suspect. He had been considered a potential suspect from the early days of the investigation, because he was the last known person to see Karen alive, although Karen's family did not believe he was the killer. After meeting David, Karen's grandmother stated that the teenager lacked the strength and physical maturity needed to carry out such a violent crime. Despite this major development, without a match to the DNA profile, the case again went cold. In 2021, Sunnyvale detective Matthew Hutchison who was born two years after Karen was murdered and had followed the case since he was a child, was the detective assigned to Karen's case. That year, he received a tip that one of the sons of a woman named Rose Aguilera Ramirez may have killed Karen. 
Detective Hutchison did not elaborate on the nature or source of this tip in the statement of facts he later used to obtain a warrant, although it has been reported that he had been working with genetic genealogists in recent years. Using public records, Detective Hutchison was able to locate a woman named Rose Aguilera Ramirez, who had lived in Fresno, California, 160 miles away from Sunnyvale, as early as 1950. She and her husband had four sons together, all of whom had been born in Fresno. Between 2021 and 2022, Detective Hutchison's work led to him being able to eliminate two of the brothers as Karen's killer. Another brother could not be conclusively eliminated, as, according to Detective Hutchison in the later Statement of Facts, based on the location of his residence, lack of publicly available information about his job and residence history at the time of the murder, and his current lifestyle, I could not do so without jeopardizing the integrity of the investigation. Detective Hutchison therefore focused in on the other remaining brother. He was able to locate a Facebook profile belonging to someone with the same name as one of the two grandchildren, named in the obituaries of Rose Aguilera Ramirez and her husband. There were comments on public posts on the page from an individual with the same name as one of the brothers who had been investigated and then eliminated. In replies to these comments, the owner of the profile called this man Uncle Rudy and referred to the other excluded brother by his first name, indicating that he was not their father. Detective Hutchison obtained this individual's birth certificate, which listed a man with the same name and birth year as the brother he was currently investigating as their father. In April of 2022, Detective Hutchison obtained a DNA sample from the owner of the Facebook profile, whose name and gender have not been revealed so as to protect their privacy. Examination of the sample showed very strong statistical support for this individual being the biological child of Karen's killer. It further found that the DNA found at the crime scene was much less statistically likely to be from one of their uncles. Using this evidence as probable cause, Detective Hutchison applied for and was granted a search warrant to obtain a DNA sample from the father of the individual who had provided a sample of their own DNA. An investigator traveled out of state to collect the sample and quickly escorted it back to California for testing. Testing of the sample confirmed that this man's DNA was a match to the DNA found on and near Karen's body. On August 2nd, 2022, a month before the 40th anniversary of the murder of Karen's death, an arrest was finally made in the case. 75-year-old Gary Jean Ramirez was arrested at his residence, a guest house in Makawao on the island of Maui in Hawaii. When Detective Hutchison arrived at the home to arrest him, Ramirez was too shocked to say anything beyond, oh my gosh. Ramirez is being charged with murder, kidnapping, and rape. If convicted, he faces life in prison without the possibility of parole. Ramirez appeared at a hearing in the Second Circuit Court via video conference from Maui Community Correctional Center on August 10th. He waived his right to an extradition hearing, and according to the deputy prosecutor in Hawaii, authorities in California are working to have Ramirez return to their jurisdiction as quickly as possible. Gary Ramirez's brother, Rudy Ramirez, also lives on the island of Maui and was shocked at his brother's arrest. He has told police that they must have arrested the wrong man. I've never seen him violent or get angry ever. He wouldn't hurt a fly, Rudy said after his brother's arrest. Gary, Rudy, and their two brothers grew up in what Rudy has described as a dysfunctional middle-class family in Fresno, where their father worked as a heavy equipment operator for the county. According to Rudy, Gary had been their parents' favorite son. Gary served in the United States Air Force in the early 1970s, and then lived in various locations throughout California and in Colorado. Rudy Ramirez had moved to Hawaii when he turned 18, and was not in contact with his younger brother at the time of Karen's murder. They were back in contact by the late 1980s, when Gary had been living in Fresno with their mother. Rudy convinced his brother to move to Hawaii with him, which Gary ultimately did. 
Gary married twice and had two children after arriving in Hawaii. He worked various jobs, often as a waiter or a bug exterminator, over the following years. By the time of his arrest, a hip injury had left him unable to work and reliant on disability payments. In his youth, he had been just shy of six feet tall, but by 2022, his health problems and age had caused him to lose about five inches in height. Karen's boyfriend at the time of her death, David, has been haunted by his decision to not stay with Karen while she waited for the bus for the past four decades. Her murder has left him exceptionally preoccupied with safety and with keeping his friends and family members safe. For 40 years, I have suffered heartache from the horrific loss of a beautiful girl whom I was falling in love with. I hope this brings some closure for her family, myself, and her other loved ones. He wrote in an email to the Mercury News after Ramirez's arrest. Karen's father and older sister both passed away prior to the arrest being made in her case. From her home in Florida, Karen's aunt has expressed her gratitude for authorities never giving up on Karen's case. Twenty-eight-year-old Nancy Benalek lived in an apartment at Arden Way and Bell Street in Sacramento and worked as a court reporter. Her fiancé, Farah Salami, also worked in the criminal justice system as a public defender. He would later gain national attention for defending serial killer Richard Chase and would go on to become Sacramento's chief public defender. Nancy and Ferris spent the evening of October 25, 1970, going out to dinner together before returning to Nancy's apartment. The couple was to be married the following month. Ferris left Nancy's apartment around 11.30 p.m. to return to his own home. When he left, Nancy was in bed. The sliding glass door to her second floor balcony was left slightly open, as she had a cat she allowed to come in and out as it pleased throughout the night. The following morning, October 26th, Nancy did not report to work, which was not typical behavior for her. One of her co-workers called her own son and asked him to go to Nancy's apartment to check on her. Her son found the apartment manager, who used his key to go into Nancy's apartment with him. Then they discovered Nancy's body in her bedroom. She had been stabbed almost 30 times, with such force that she had nearly been decapitated. Defensive wounds indicated that she had fought against her killer. Authorities were able to determine that the murderer had accessed the apartment by climbing up to Nancy's balcony and entering through the slightly ajar sliding door, and that he had wrapped tape around all of his fingers to prevent him from leaving fingerprints behind. Nancy's murder raised concerns that a serial killer may have been operating in the area as one of Nancy's neighbors. Another young woman with a successful career who was about to be married had been killed just seven months earlier. 23-year-old Judith Hakari was last seen leaving her shift as a nurse at Sutter Memorial Hospital on March 7, 1970. She had called her fiance at 11.30 p.m to tell him she was on her way home, but she never arrived. Her fiancé eventually went out to look for her and discovered her car parked in its assigned spot, but no sign of Judith herself. This led to concerns that she had been abducted as she walked from her car to her apartment, which was only a block away from where Nancy lived. Hikers found Judith's body weeks later in a shallow grave in Placer County. Unfortunately, even after decades passed and DNA technology advanced, DNA could not be used to either confirm or disprove a connection between the two cases. The evidence from Judith's case that potentially contained DNA from her killer was accidentally damaged and could not be tested. A source of DNA evidence was still available in Nancy's case, thankfully. Police had identified a blood trail that started on Nancy's balcony and continued onto the sidewalk below and around the buildings of the complex before ending in the parking lot. Investigators believed that the killer had cut himself while attacking Nancy and left the trail of blood behind as he made his way to a car parked in the lot. 
A DNA profile was developed from the blood left behind in this trail. It was uploaded to the combined DNA index system, but no match was found. Years passed, and no profile matching that from Nancy's crime scene was ever uploaded to the database. Then, in 2019, investigators from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Team and the Sacramento County District Attorney's Office began using forensic genetic genealogy in their investigations. The effort ultimately helped identify what they believed to be the killer's family. One member of this family seemed like a promising suspect, as he had lived in the same apartment complex as Nancy at the time of her murder. One of his relatives provided a sample of their DNA, which, based on the amount of DNA they shared with the profile from the crime scene, confirmed that the potential suspect was the person whose blood was left at the scene. On August 10, 2022, the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office announced that after more than 50 years, they had identified Nancy's killer as Richard John Davis. Davis had been 27 years old at the time of the murder. He had no known violent criminal history, although he had once been arrested for driving while intoxicated. Unfortunately, Davis could not be charged with Nancy's murder, as he had died in Sacramento County in November of 1997. It is believed that his death was the result of complications from alcoholism. Davis's apartment had been just across the complex's pool from Nancy's, and he most likely could have seen inside her apartment. While they cannot ask Davis about the motive for the crime, police believe he may have developed a fixation on Nancy after watching her in her apartment from his. Davis and his roommate had been among the more than 500 people who were interviewed by police in the month following Nancy's murder, but they had provided alibis for each other. Nancy's fiance at the time of her death, Ferris Salami, did not live to see her killer identified. He passed away due to leukemia in 2014 at the age of 84. Nancy's sister Linda had started to give up hope that Nancy's case would ever be solved. In a letter read at the press conference announcing Davis's identification, she expressed her gratitude for the work that went into solving the case, as well as her sadness over everything in her life she never got to share with her sister. In 1992, 53-year-old John Stanger was a hard-working employee of Orange County, Florida's maintenance department. He lived in a home on the county's maintenance property on North Forsyth Road. Around 5.30 a.m. on August 10, 1992, John's wife went to wake him up for the day. He was cold to the touch. She realized he had extensive injuries to his head and to his face and was no longer alive. A person of interest was quickly identified in the case. John had a friend named Ronald Cates who had a drug problem and not enough money to support it or his family. John had recently allowed Cates to borrow some of his power tools. Unbeknownst to John, Cates had pawned the tools to get cash. Shortly before he was murdered, John had confronted Cates and told him that he had to finally return the tools. When police went to interview Cates, his daughter answered the door to the home, visibly shaking. Authorities would later learn that her father had ordered her to lie to the police and tell them that he wasn't home while he went to hide under the house. Cates could not avoid the police for long and spoke to them on August 11th and August 18th. There were inconsistencies in his statements and with the timelines provided by his family members. Still, police did not have direct evidence tying him to the crime. During a suicidal incident in 1995, Cates reportedly confessed to killing John in front of his family. His family members reported the confession to police, but given the circumstances of the confession and the continuing lack of corroborating evidence, Cates was not charged with the murder. Decades would pass before investigators had enough evidence to file charges in John's case. On August 10th, 2022, 30 years to the day after John's murder, Orange County Sheriff John Mina announced that Ronald Cates had been charged with John's murder 
and was being held in a North Carolina jail pending extradition back to Florida. Kate's arrest was finally made based on his own actions and the efforts of his own family, who had come to police in 2020 to make sure John's case was still being actively investigated. They all wanted justice for John, even if it meant confirming their husband or father's involvement in the crime. John had always been kind to them, providing them with money and shelter when they were struggling. The family members had been limited in how forthcoming they could be at the time of John's murder, because Kate's was very abusive and they lived in fear of him. The more casual check-ins with police about the case and its progress turned into more extensive interviews in March of 2022. During these interviews, the family members were able to provide very detailed timelines of the hours around the time of John's murder, which showed that Kate's did have time to go to John's house and commit the murder. They also mentioned that Kate's liked to walk with a walking stick, a detail which stuck out to investigators. A large stick had been found at the crime scene. Investigators were able to provide a photograph of the stick to Kate's family, and they confirmed that it looked like the walking stick Kate's had been using around the time of the murder. The final piece of evidence came in April of 2022, when Kate's again confessed to the murder. This time, however, he confessed multiple times, and his confession was eventually captured on video. Cates was having a mental evaluation in a North Carolina hospital when he allegedly told a nurse that he had killed a man in Florida in 1992. The nurse went to get a security guard, and Cates made the same confession to the guard. The nurse and the guard used the internet to do research to see if the claim could be true, and found John Stanger's case on the Orange County Sheriff's website. They then notified local authorities about the confession. Officers from the Salisbury Police Department responded to the hospital, and Cates gave them a 10 to 12 minute long confession, which was captured on the officer's body cameras. Cates did not provide a motive for the murder. He did explain that, in his words, he had hit Johnny with a stick. Authorities in Florida re-interviewed Cates and believed they now had sufficient evidence to charge him with first-degree murder which led to Kate's being arrested on August 5th. John's murder is the 13th case solved by the Orange County Sheriff's Office's Cold Case Unit since the unit was established in 2020.